So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Doran. I am a technical sales specialist for ITM Instruments. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar offered by ITM University. Today's topic is how ground testing keeps us safe, presented by Megger. Uh, throughout the presentation, we're going to kindly ask you to mute your microphone. The presentation should be anywhere between 40 and 45 minutes, and we'll have a time allotted at the end to take any and all Q&A. We do encourage you to ask any and all questions. It is great to have an expert like Jeff uh, connected with us today, so please take advantage. Use the chat feature uh, to get in all your questions, whether it be throughout the presentation or, or at the very end as well. Uh, ITM Instruments and Mega have been working closely together for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Mega in Canada. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, our service, and our competitive pricing. Today's webinar is presented by Jeff Jowett. Uh, he is a senior applications engineer with four, over 40 years of instrumentation experience, the last 25 or so years in marketing and distribution sales. Jeff has written numerous uh, trade journal articles, conducted trainings for distributor sales staff as well as customers, and he has been a speaker at various electrical societies, uh, including the NETA and NJATC. Jeff, I will turn the presentation over to you. Good day, everyone. I thank you very much for uh, attending our webinar. And we're going to get right underway and we're going to discuss various aspects of uh, ground testing and grounding itself. We'll talk a little bit about how to, how to do a good ground and so forth. So we're, we're going to cover quite a few topics. Uh, we're going to begin with earth testing methods. And why do we want to do this? Well, First of all, uh, it, it's a good idea if you're uh, in a conversation with anyone uh, regarding uh, anything that has to do with grounding, uh, define your terms first. Uh, a lot of confusion I've noticed that over the years in uh, talking about uh, talking with customers about their own clients and so forth, uh, they do have problems where uh, the ter they're not using the same terms. So uh, the word ground in the electrical industry does get bandied around quite a bit. So, uh, you know, it, it can save you some pain uh, trying to sort things out later, later on if you, if you really make sure that anybody you're dealing with, uh, you're on the same page. Now, of course, if you're only working for yourself, uh, then it's not so much of a consideration. Uh, but to, just to give you an idea, uh, the word ground is very often used meaning a short to ground or a fault to ground. So someone will say, I have a ground and a motor and, and what they're really referring to is the electrical windings have shorted out to the case of the motor or something of, of that sort. Uh, we're not gonna talk too much about that, maybe a little bit, uh, but mostly we're gonna be talking about a grounding electrode, uh, which is actually the right term for it. Uh, and that's your buried metal structure. It's outside the building, buried in the ground. And, and we're gonna come back to that several times on uh, what it does and you know, how, to, how, to, how to test it, how to make the best use out of it. Uh, this is just some, some preliminary comments here that uh, the uh, purposes of having a good, a good grounding system in your electrical facility uh, you want to be able to default fault currents. That's yeah, that's probably number one. Uh, you have problems on a utility, something goes wrong on the utility, uh, and a, a spike or something of that sort can come down the line into your facility, and you don't want it. So you want to get it out of your electrical system and down into the ground. Uh, of course, lightning strikes, depending on where you are, uh, they're huge. In Canada, I'm really not sure. I, I don't have a lot of background information in that regard as to whether it's a big problem in, in Canada or not, but certainly in the U.S. it is. And so uh, a good ground will default safely, uh, defer lightning strokes uh, into the ground and out of your electrical equipment. And then some other things that people don't think so much about, uh, static. Uh, operation of machinery can build up static charges a thing like a, a, a belt that's, that's moving in a motor, uh, that can create 
uh, a separation of charge. And if static builds up enough, it'll, it'll uh, arc and it'll find somewhere to go. And so what you want to have is a good grounding system in place so that anything of that sort will just go into the ground and back where it came from uh, and not be going through your computer system or something of that sort. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, things like basically noise. So this would be uh, all your office equipment, uh, a lot of your uh, very complex uh, process control type equipment, and they, uh, they can dump a lot of, uh, they chop up the sine wave is what happens. And then they, they have a tendency to, to, to jump what, uh, dump what's not used uh, back onto the grounding system. Uh, or on the electrical system if they can't find if they can't find anywhere else. And so again, you you don't want this noise going through your equipment. Uh, it can affect the performance of your computers and things of that sort. So instead, you want to have a good low impedance path straight into the earth to get rid of these problem currents from your electrical system. So this is a uh, just some of the benefits. Uh, obviously, in injury prevention, uh, safety and prevention of injury uh, is really paramount uh, because uh, a person can become the the, the path to ground. Uh, if you, you get across a voltage gradient and there's no better path, then, then uh, it'll, it'll travel through the human body and you can have electrocutions and injuries that way. Uh, and so, so you, you definitely want to keep all your equipment and your working environment and so forth. You want to keep it well grounded and you want to keep it safe. Uh, lightning, uh, obviously we said, uh, and uh, uh, computer and, com and communication equipment and so forth. And we, we keep the noise out of that and just keep it operating on its, you know, its little three volt signal or whatever it's used. All right, so that's just a, a quick look at uh, why you want to have a good ground and what that will do for you. Uh, now we'll take a look at some of the theory uh, that's behind earth testing and how it works. And we're going to start by looking at the two types of tests, which are very similar in their name. Uh, and so they can become confused and they do sometimes become confused in, in conversations, resistivity and resistance. And they're actually completely separate. And we're going to look at each one. And uh, resistivity, that's the electrical properties of the soil itself. So remember, soil is a pretty good electric conductor, conductor. It can be. It varies quite a bit. But it can be a pretty good electrical conductor, um, mainly because it has moisture and it has ions from salts and things of that sort. Uh, in the soil that carry current, uh, and and even more so because uh, there's just so much of it. So the, a, a current doesn't uh, encounter a whole lot of resistance except at the beginning, uh, which we'll come back to. Uh, but if, if a current is free to wander in the soil, it has a lot of area to wander through, and so uh, and, and so the soil actually has pretty good electrical properties. But we want to learn about those. We want to know how you can use that. And we want to also be able to uh, uh, learn how to test it. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the, the second part of this, of course, is resistance. And this is where you have an electrode that's buried in the soil. This is your ground rod. Or by extension, uh, it can be something you know much larger, like a grid or whatever. Uh, main thing to remember there, uh, just to keep it in focus, is that a big grid, it could be a quarter acre underneath a substation or whatever, but that's really doing the same thing that, that a ground rod does. All it's doing is just putting more, more metal into the ground to, uh, to decrease the resistance and to facilitate the current flow. Uh, but the two things, a single ground rod or, or a whole substation grid, in their most common parameters, they're pretty much the same. And, and we'll take a look at how you, 
can treat them in, in separately where, where it's necessary, but how in many cases, like testing and so forth, you, you treat them pretty much as the same. So from here, we'll take a look at earth resistivity. And so uh, you can test for resistivity. We're gonna show you how to do that with a common ground tester. And uh, the reasons you would wanna do that, uh, you can find a good place to install a ground if you if you have any you know options available a lot of times you don't uh, but if you're on a, a fairly large property or something like that uh, you can look for the lowest resistivity spot and uh, you know that would be the the place to put up your cell tower or or whatever it is that you have in mind uh, and then uh, in addition uh, you you may not have that kind of freedom uh, but at the same time, you can still use the data uh, to construct your ground system. And so we'll look at uh, earth composition. Uh, that's extremely important. Uh, moisture is obviously important. And temperature, these are all variables that affect your resistivity around the, ca around the cowan. And let's see that last note there mentions uh, the water table, yeah. Uh, and, the, and the frost line. Uh, well, up in Canada, uh, frost line uh, is, I'm sure, uh, rather important. Uh, parts down in the United States and so forth, uh, it, it isn't so much of a factor. Uh, but thing to remember there is, if the moisture freezes, it's no different than having a, a frozen battery in your car. It's the same effect. It immobilizes current flow. So you do always want to make sure, and, and if you're pretty far north, I, I, I guess that you know there could be uh, some additional considerations involved in that. Uh, but you do want to make sure that your grounding electrode is below the frost line because otherwise, in the dead of winter, uh, you're basically going to have no ground. Uh, on the other hand, water table is a very good thing. If you can reach down to water table, that puts you in. Uh, a constant moist environment, uh, it can be expensive to do. But if you can do that, uh, that's, that's a good safe uh, grounding measure. Okay, now we'll look at how to do a resistivity test. So you can take a, 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 you know, a standard ground tester. The one thing you have to know here is it must have four terminals. Some ground testers only have three terminals. And with that, which we will see during this presentation, you can do a ground test of your electrode, but you cannot do a soil resistivity test unless you have four terminals. And this is the reason for it right here. You see the, you see the simplified schematic of it. This is what is commonly referred to as Wenner method named after Frank Wenner, a guy in the early part of the 20th century with the US Geological Survey, I believe, who invented all this. Um, there are other methods, uh, but you know this is only a one hour presentation, so we won't go into that much depth. Uh, the Wenner is by far the most commonly used. And if you do wanna use another method, it, it's just an adaptation of this. It's, it won't be anything drastically different. But you know here what you're doing, uh, you've got four terminals on your tester and two of them are current terminals and they're on the outside. And two of them are potential terminals and they're on the inside. And in the winter method, they're equidistantly spaced. In some of the other methods, the spacing is different, but in winter, you space them equidistantly. And that is the depth to which you, you wanna measure. So that letter A in there, if that's 15 feet or eight feet or whatever it happens to be, uh, that's how deep you're gonna be looking down into the soil. And when you energize your tester, uh, I'm sure quite a few of you have probably already recognized this from other types of, uh, of electrical test equipment, low resistance ohmmeters, for instance, use the same basic schematic which is to say a kelvin bridge 
And what this is telling you is the tester will now <laughs> inject a test current through the soil between the current probes. Uh, we use an alternating square wave to defeat interference from other frequencies. Or, uh, you know, a DC test, you would have all sorts of problems with interference if you tried DC. So this uses a square wave. And then uh, the two inner probes, the potential probes, look at the drop, the voltage drop caused by the resistance against that test current. And then it simply uses Ohm's law and it cal calculates out a resistance reading. And that's what you're going to see on your display, except uh, resistivity is a volumetric uh, measurement. So that is to say uh, your, your soil is three-dimensional. It's not going in a straight line like a wire. So your soil is three-dimensional. So resistivity is a volumetric measurement. And so you need to correct for that and that's where you see that little formula down there, 2 pi AR. And what that is, uh, of course, 2 times pi. And then A would be your spacing. And R would be your resistance off of your meter. And then that would give you your soil resistivity, average soil resistivity to a depth of A, equivalent, uh, equivalent to uh, ohm centimeters, in ohm centimeters. Uh, that's the industry standard. If you want to use some other ohm feet or ohm inches or whatever, you can do that. But industry standard is ohm centimeters. And uh, in the old days, you, you had to have a calculator or pencil and paper or something like that and do it. Uh, but the more sophisticated testers nowadays have the winner formula and some of the other as well built into them. So you can just tell the tester what you saw on your display and it'll it'll make that winner calculation for you. And one other point here, you notice where it says A equals uh, A over 20. Uh, that's the depth. Well, if you were doing this perfectly by the book, it is the standard procedure is to drive your probes to 1 20th the, uh, the horizontal spacing. However, uh, especially at shallower depths, that can be difficult to do. And I can just tell you this much from speaking to people who do this for a living, uh, evidently the 120th, it only makes it perfect. It doesn't, it's not 100% necessary. Uh, you can work within the parameters that you have available, you know, to get enough bite uh, on your probe so that you can make a measurement and so forth. So do the 120th, if, you know, if you can, and especially if you're submitting a report, it might be nice to have that in there. Uh, but if there's some problem where that that may be difficult to do, then you know, just work with what you can to get a good measurement, and and don't worry about it; you'll be fine. Okay, uh, so th this is pretty much just a review then of, of what we just talked about the uh, uh, the three parameters. Uh, that are going to be used in a resistivity measurement and how to do the calculation. So, okay, uh, you're all going to come away from this presentation with knowing how to do that. And also note, uh, you can get some added information out of, out of simply doing mathematical uh, rearranging and you can calculate out the resistivity uh, in that manner. That was a quick look at resistivity and how you're going to use it. And I, I, I hope that was reasonably clear. Uh, one thing I, I do, do want to add on that, um, the, once you've gotten a resistivity measurement and you, and you want to install a ground, uh, there's essentially two ways to go about that. And one that's very common is drive and test. So, you drive a rod deeper or you add another rod in parallel and you run a test and then you see what you got. And then if, if, if it doesn't meet your spec, then you, you add another rod. Uh, and that's commonly done. There's really nothing wrong with that. The only problem with it is it can become counterproductive after a while because you get smaller and smaller increments 
as you add more and more to the grounding electrode. So a second way to do that is to go to your grounding materials companies and ask them for uh, a, 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 a software. Uh, you can get a software download typically, and it'll ask you some critical questions. Uh, what is what is your soil resistivity? You'd have to put that in there. You'd have to tell the so software what your soil resistivity is. And you, of course, you would tell it what your ground requirement is, whether you're trying to meet five ohms or two ohms or whatever. Uh, and it'll calculate it out for you and show you, okay, you want uh, 20, uh, 10 foot ground rods arranged in a triangle or whatever it is. So uh, that's a good convenient way to go uh, if you're faced with an issue of having to uh, design and install a new grounding system or improve the one that you already have. Okay, now we'll look at resistance, uh, which is now you've got your electrode installed. And so now you want to know how good is it? Uh, why do we test? Uh, what are the components uh, of a grounding system and so forth? We'll look at these kind of individually. Uh, and I've, I've, I've kind of touched on this already. You could have a single rod. Uh, you could have uh, a much more complex array. Uh, you'll get debate on this depending on who you talk to, but yeah, there's at least a reasonable school of thought that a deep driven rod, especially if it hits water table, is your best ground. However, not everybody will agree with that uh, because there are, you know, there are variables that are involved in this. Uh, but the big problem with a deep driven rod is it can be very expensive. Uh, another thing that you can do uh, is uh, drill a borehole and then backfill it with a conductive material. Instead of just letting the earth itself compact around it, uh, you can get something like uh, bentonite, which is a naturally occurring mineral, or uh, ground enhancement material, which is an artificial version of the same thing. And you can backfill a deep driven rod and that'll help you. Uh, and then of course, your complex systems, they tend to be shallower, uh, and much more spread out. And that would be where you would have uh, something like a mesh or a grid. Okay, so now we've got that in place and why do we wanna test it? Uh, one of the problems, it may seem like a no brainer, but actually uh, in the real world, uh, it really isn't so much of a no brainer. It actually comes up quite a bit. Uh, driving the ground rod and hooking up your electrical system, at that point, a lot of people forget about it. Uh, it's out of sight, out of mind. Well, that's not good. Uh, they, the, whether it's a single rod or whether it's a whole grid, uh, it can be eroding away underground. Uh, if you have a lightning clearance, the, the clearance may have gone fine. You may know that your building was hit and you may know that there's no uh, you know, there's no problem to any of your equipment and your grounding system did its job, but that does not mean that it's still there. Uh, it can break, a grid can break apart underground. Uh, so there, there are various hazards uh, that a grounding electrode experiences being buried underground. And so this is why you test it. Uh, obviously, it's not at all practic practical to dig it up and, and look at it, that's not, an, that's not an option. But you don't have to do that. Instead, you can go to a ground tester and you can perform a test that will tell you uh, if your grid is intact and, and what, your, what your resistance is. And so we're gonna take a look at that. And uh, we're gonna, there's a lot of different procedures. We can't cover them all in a one hour presentation. Uh, we will take a look at a couple of the most common ones. Okay. Now this has to do with substation protection. Uh, this is step and touch. Uh, and this is for uh, particularly uh, 
I mean, if you have your own power plant on the premises or something like that, you could probably do this also. Uh, but it's primarily it's done at substations. Uh, the idea is you want the vicinity of the substation, not just the interior of it, but the vicinity around it needs to be electrically safe. Uh, and so uh, that's where step and touch potentials come in. A, uh, a touch potential would be how much voltage would someone, this could be you know, a utility operator or it could just be some guy passing by. Uh, and if you happen to come in contact with the fence and a fault is currently being cleared, that's the danger zone. And so what would happen if you touch the fence? Well, you take your, your four terminal ground tester, you run one of your current probes up onto the fence. And then, uh, and then your other current, current probe goes driven into the ground where we, we see the C there. That's remote. You just try to get that far away. That's, that's all, no real parameters on that. Just get it far away. And then your potential probes, they're going to go from the fence to a probe driven at about three feet from the fence. And you energize the tester, you want to get a, a resistance measurement. And that's going to figure into your touch potential and then for step potential you do about uh three feet which is the, the about the average uh distance of a human stride so you would <clears throat> so you now you would have two probes driven outside the fence in the vicinity about three feet apart and then you measure a resistance and then you take that and ohm's law and the maximum fault current that's specified for that facility. And when you multiply them out, you don't want your voltage to go more than about 50 volts. It, it may vary from, <clears throat> from one jurisdiction to another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, uh, some places may say 40 volts, but typically, in other words, just a safe voltage so that no one walking by the fence and touching it is going to be hit with 500 volts or 120 volts or anything of that sort. So those are your two step and touch potentials. Those are uh, a diagram of ground potential rise. Uh, in other words, this is what you're uh, needing to guard against. The fact that when your fault current is free to wander wherever it wants to through the soil, it has very low resistance and, 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 and it spreads out quite a bit. Uh, but then as it approaches the, uh, the grid, the substation grid, for instance, then, then the potential, now the, the uh, current, the path of the current <coughs> has to narrow down considerably. And consequently, uh, your voltage will rise and you can, you can have a dangerous ground potential rise. And so you do, need to make sure that you're guarded against that. Now we'll take a look at the actual uh, electrode itself, ground rod, whatever it happens to be. And we'll take a look at the various parameters uh, that are around it. And three elements that we look that we're sort of illustrating rather simply here are uh, the resistance of the rod itself. That's negligible. You don't worry about that. The resistance of the contact with the surrounding soil. And there you might think there would be a problem, but as a rule, there isn't. There can be in, in uh, unusual circumstances, but as a rule, there's not. Usually the transfer from the rod into the soil works reasonably well. So it's the resistance of the surrounding body of earth that creates the problem. <clears throat> this is where current, your full current has to spread out and, uh, and reach a maximum that's within a safe level for your operating facility. And we'll take a look at that. Okay, so we mentioned 
Uh, we've mentioned touch potential so forth, so we, we don't really need to go into that in any great detail. But we'll take a look at two pole and three pole methods, and we'll take a look at some of the different technologies and, and some of the different test methods. And so now the next uh, pretty uh, obvious question then would be, okay, we're, we're gonna measure our ground system. What are we gonna look for? Well, obviously the lower resistance, the better, but you can't get zero. Theoretically, it might be a nice idea, but it doesn't really work. So instead, you're gonna to have to adapt to some sort of standard or other. And uh, depending on what industry you're in or, or <coughs> excuse me, I, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know why I'm having so much of a problem. <coughs> it's cold in this, I'm in the factory and it's cold in here and I had to apologize for you. It's, uh, to you because it's, it's bothering me unusually. Uh, at any rate, industry standard, uh, the, the one thing that you'll see pervasively throughout literature is 25 ohms. Now, in the US, we have the National, National Electric Code. You know, I would imagine that Canada has something similar to that. And that says 25 ohms or less. But that's a very forgiving standard. Its only purpose uh, is to assure that buildings aren't going to catch fire and people aren't going to get electrocuted. It doesn't really concern itself <clears throat> with the performance of your equipment, which of course can be vital. So uh, in commercial and industrial applications, then uh, much more stringent standards come into play. And generally, the kind of industry standard will be five ohms. Usually, if you can hit a five ohm ground, in most industrial and commercial type applications, you're, you're pretty good. Uh, you're doing okay, you should be all right. However, there are some, as we see here in, in this graphic, there are some industries that are much more uh, demanding, uh, things like substations and so forth, chemical plants, <coughs> computer room grounding, they have much more rigorous requirements. And so you may need to go, you may need to go much lower on your ground resistance, depending on who the authority is that you're uh, that you're uh, answering to, or you know, to, uh, being in performance with. Now, what we're going to show here, we're going to start from the simplest, and we're going to go to the uh, to the to the more thorough test. This is the simplest test for grounding resistance. <coughs> I should mention that this is covered in the IEEE grounding standard 81. So sometimes if you're dealing with third party involvements, sometimes you do wanna have a standard agency to make reference to. And in that case, uh, IEEE 81, is, that's the standard as far as grounding and ground testing is concerned. This is what is called the, the dead earth method, uh, by which it means that you're making a connection out to some other earthing return that is not part of an electrical system, hence dead. And so this is just a two point measurement. This is like taking a voltmeter or a DMM They've taken two leads and hooked them up across something and taken the measurement. And what happens here, uh, the most common 
return that it, it is used most often in the industry is uh, the water pipe system because it's it's pervasive. It's around just about everywhere. It's large and it's uh, and it's metallic, and so uh, so generally uh, it provides a decent return. And so you're sending a test current through the earth from your tester, which we see up on the top there. Note that the tester has current and voltage capabilities in it. So it's, it's injecting a current and it's measuring a voltage, as we said. And then what this will give you is a loop resistance of that entire series loop. And what you're hoping is that uh, the return, which is to say the water pipe system and the leads, uh, are not contributing very much at all to that measurement. So most of what you're seeing in the measurement would be uh, what is coming, you know, uh, the current that's making it through the earth over to your return. So this is a better than nothing test. And that's the only time that it's really recommended. And so what you want to keep in mind here if you're in a really bad situation, this applies mostly to, to downtown urban, where you just don't have anywhere to work. So you can, you can usually find a return somewhere uh, and do a two-point method like this. And all it is, it's just better than nothing. It's not really a good thorough test. And so you would only do this if it's the only option left to you. So here we see uh, what I've kind of already mentioned, uh, the parameters that are concerned with this. And I think they pretty much speak for themselves. Okay, now we'll move to the best ground testing method that exists, and that is fall of potential. So you'll see this all the time in the literature. And uh, <clears throat> you can do this as we see here with a, with a three terminal ground tester. And you're now going to connect your common terminal. We'll go to the ground that you're measuring, ground that you want to test. And then you run your current terminal. That will go out as far as you can get it. So generally, it's it's just a good idea to just you know work within the room, the spacing and the distances and so forth that you have, and try to get that out as far as you can. And we'll see why in just a moment. And then your potential terminal is going to be in between, and that's going to measure your voltage drop and give you your resistance to wherever you put it. So. Uh, then in a full of potential test, what you want to do is proof your site by moving that potential probe and taking a series of readings. So this is the basic measurement. Hook up to your ground, run a current probe out as far as you can, connect the lead up to that, run a potential probe out at some convenient, meaningful distance in between, connect that up, energize your tester and you will get a resistance reading and that is the reading of the resistance of what we show here as a that would be that distance and now you're going to you're going to make a series of readings by moving your potential spike and you're going to plot these readings against distance and this is what is called a fall of potential graph and you will see this in the literature. And there have been many times in which I've had customers call uh, they're from a testing service and their client wants them to, uh, uh, to uh, create a full fall of potential graph and submit that as part of their test result. They don't get paid unless they do that because it's a way that the client knows <clears throat> that the test is done right. 
and that the reason that the uh, answer that uh, the result is reliable and, and we'll see why okay so here's here's your fundamental setup now and note that uh, you've got your uh, current probe with a with a sphere of influence around it and you've got a potential probe in between and and of course your test ground and those broken lines there, they're there to show you the field of influence, the electrical field that's associated with those, with those two probes. And note that they're separate. And we'll see why in just a moment. So now this is what you would get if you did the full graph. This is your full of potential graph. And so note, what you're looking for is where that line flattens out in the middle. That's your reading. And, and, we'll, and we'll show you why in just a moment. Now, I think we have a series. Yeah, this is, shows you right here. So watch how that goes. This is what you're doing. This is what the operator is actually doing by moving his probe and taking a series of measurements and then creating that graph. You're looking for that place where that graph levels off and that that is the resistance reading of your test ground so if that levels off at 15 ohms you don't have a very good ground if that levels off at three and a half ohms you're probably in good shape and you will see 62 percent very often in the literature and uh, that comes from ideal situations it's not a good idea to do this as a one-shot test because there could be a, a water pipe running under that spot and that could be influencing that reading. So it's not a good idea as a one-shot test, but if, if you're doing repeat testing, maintenance testing on a site that you're familiar with, you can cut this down considerably and just take a reading at 62%, okay? And so this, I think, uh, yeah, this just gives you some ideas about, well, okay, how, how far do I put out my current probe? Well, that's an obvious question. And uh, the idea behind this, uh, you'll see in the tables, uh, in the literature, you'll see tables that will tell you to space your current probe as far away, depending on the dimensions of your test ground. And the main thing to remember about that is those tables are not scientific, they're guidelines. Uh, if you can't reach that kind of distance that the table tells you, you don't have enough space, run your test in the space that you have. And if you get a coherent, clean fall of potential graph like we just saw, it's good. Don't worry about it. So the tables are just guidelines, but you will see them in the literature. And here's what you're trying to avoid. This is the situation where your current probe is too close and its electrical sphere is interfering with the electrical sphere of the ground you're trying to test. And what happens then is your line keeps going up and you don't see on there where it levels off. And so this, is, this test is basically no good, except there are procedures that that we, we can't go into today in the interest of time, uh, something called the slope method, for instance. So there are things you can do if you're in tight environments and you don't have a lot of room to work in. There are other methods that you can go, uh, that, that you can uh, go to, and I'll be glad to help you with those if they ever come up, if that ever comes up where you need some help. With it. And so this is just a quick recap here of, uh, why the fall of potential? It's it's by far your best method and the, the most accurate and clear, uh, but it does have some uh, down uh, stroke to it uh, in terms mainly that it's a lot of work. You're doing a lot of walking back and forth and so forth. So it's labor intensive. Okay, simplified fall of potential. This is just the same idea made a lot quicker. I won't, uh, we're kind of running out of time, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail on it. Uh, but basically, you're using fewer measurements. You're doing something very similar to a fall of potential, 
but now you're only going to measure three points, half the distance and then 10% 10, 10 in and 10% out of the distance to your current probe. And then you'll see over on the left side of the display, there's a, uh, uh, a little mathematical crunch that you put those numbers through. It's very simple. And what that tells you is what your percent accuracy is. So, uh, you know, if you got two and a half ohms at your 50% position and you did this calculation uh, and you got a 2% accuracy, well, you'd be pretty happy. And that's probably be a pretty good result. If you got a 10% accuracy, well, you would never buy a multimeter with a 10% accuracy. So again, you would throw that out and, and try to go to plan B. And now I guess there's just the last two quick things to talk about. Art method, clamp on method. Uh, art method, this is a tester that has a built-in current clamp. And some advanced models of, of ground testers will have a current clamp built in. And what you can do with that, it's a way of separating uh, your, uh, your utility ground from your on-site ground. Because if you're, you know, if you're on a new construction site, you don't have to worry. Uh, but if you're testing something that's been up and running, well, then uh, your ground bus is jumper to your grounded neutral, and that's that's grounded all the way back to the utility transformer. So if you make a test of that, you're you're getting a perfectly good measurement. Except the problem is that it, it's the whole system in parallel. It's not just your ground. So if you use the art method, you, you put the current clamp below your alligator clip. And what that does, it tells the measurement module how much current, this is the test current that the tester is putting out, how much of that is going to ground through your local ground, and it ignores the rest of it that goes back through the utility ground, which you don't care about. And so it gives you your measurement based on just your local ground. And that's your art method. And then the last thing that we can do with two clamps uh, is the clamp on method. And of course, this is typically combined into handheld uh, testers that actually have two windings in the jaw. One of them is a voltage winding, one of them is a current winding. A very simple test. You clamp over your ground rod or your grounding conductor and you press a button and within seconds you get your reading. A lot simpler than doing full of potential. However, it does have some drawbacks. And the two main ones are shorts and opens, which is to say, if you have a short, which would be that uh, your electrical, uh, uh, your, elect your electrode, your grounding electrode is connected back to the electrical system at more than one point. As long as you've got a single point connection, you can use a clamp on. But if it's connected at more than one point, then your test current is going to loop around to that other ground or the other four grounds or however many uh, connections there happen to be. And it's going to loop back through metal and give you a beautiful low reading and you think you have a great low ground and you don't because it's only measuring metal continuity. So if you have a short, uh, you can't use a clamp on. And the open would be something like commissioning a new ground where the, uh, uh, the grounding electrode hasn't been connected to the electrical system because what the clamp on does it energizes the ground rod inductively and it sends an inductive current through the soil and then that current finds its own way back. It operates on its own, so to speak. And what it normally does is find the grounded utility out at the, uh, at the pole line or someplace like that and circulates back through the utility. And so, you know, you typically you figure, well, the utility ground uh, shouldn't be contributing very much. So most of what I'm seeing is is my on-site ground. And it's a pretty good, reliable method. Uh, but if you don't have a return, you can't use it. 
And with that, oh yeah, okay, we did have something also. Uh, yeah, we did want to mention here about substation testing. This is just a quick mention. Uh, our real high-end unit here, the D2-3, has additional noise suppression capabilities, particularly good for substation environments, because that's where you're gonna have your biggest problem with getting noise interference and your readings are going to be destabilized. And so you wanna have a tester that has maximum noise capability. You wanna be able to adjust the test frequency to find a quiet frequency. Uh, you want to have filter engagement. Uh, you want to have high and low power capability. So all of those things you, you put to use in getting a good ground reading at a thing like a substation. And then note uh, the daisy chain reels here. Again, in the, in the old days, uh, running wire out hundreds of feet could be a real problem. We've made it very much easier. So now you can buy these reels, as many as you want, and they just daisy chain together and then they roll right back up again. So it really uh, decreases your test time, makes it much more efficient, and, and uh, you can go out as far as you want and, uh, and test at any, at any distance you want. And uh, with that, I think I've just about, and I'm, I apologize for all the coughing, and, uh, I never had a problem like that before, but I'm, as a result of me being delayed, I think I uh, used up most of the uh, question time. However, uh, you're certainly welcome to come in through email, and I would be glad to answer any questions that you want, you, you want to pose. Perfect, Jeff. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. We do have a couple minutes, and we did get questions in throughout the presentation. So um, right. just a quick reminder to everyone, uh, considering we don't have much time, if you do have questions at the end or you only think about them after the webinar, uh, you can go to our website, itm.com. You can find our Contact Us page. You'll find our email address, our phone number, as well as uh, the chat function to connect live with one of our uh, technical support uh, staff to help you with any and all questions, as well as any specific questions about uh, product recommendations, pricing, availability, rentals, anything like that, all the information can be found at itm.com. Um, so Jeff, just quickly a couple questions. Um, a question from Flora uh, came in. Um, when there are several ground rods on a site, uh, when testing, should they all be connected? Yeah, that, that's a particular issue in solar. Uh, if yeah, if you're doing anything in solar, test them by segments, uh, because by the time that whole field gets connected, you know, you're going to have to go out two miles or something to make a test. Uh, generally, if the, uh, in a more general sense, if the rods are in a fairly close environment, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of reason to, uh, to test them individually. You can, you know, you, you might find something of interest, but you don't really have to do that. Uh, it's when they get paralleled together that that's when the test is really becomes potent. Uh, and that's when you really need to do it. Before that, it, 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 it's kind of like the, the operator's preference. Uh, but uh, the one exception that it's really notable is solar, uh, because they do have a lot of problems there. And, it, and in there, it's recommended to test by segments. In other types of ground, I don't think so. Perfect, thank you. So last quick question. Uh, this is relatively general, but we'll ask it nonetheless. Desmond asked if there's any special requirements for testing healthcare facilities. For testing, what was the second part of that? Healthcare facilities. Oh, uh, no. Uh, really, it's, it's just your, uh, uh, you, you would certainly have some authority that will tell you what they want to have. So what you want to do is, you know, look for the relevant authority in your area. And they should be specifying, you know, be some sort of association or, or government function or whatever uh, that should be specifying what they want to see everything grounded as because patients, you can't have them, you know, getting an, even, even a simple electrical tingle. 
on a patient. No, that can't happen. So, so there will be parameters available. Uh, but as far as the grounding and testing, uh, there's nothing critically different in that regard. It's just that you're probably going to have to meet tougher numbers. Uh, and also, and I should mention the bonding is going to be very important uh, in healthcare because all of that hospital equipment, it can't shock the patient. It's got to be, it's got to be bonded back to your ground bus at a very low impedance so that there's no back feet of any kind of voltage or anything of that sort. And you can do that with a ground tester, uh, but you do want to make sure uh, that you not only test your grounding electrode, but test all your bonds from the pieces of equipment all the way back to the ground bus. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. To respect everyone's time, we are at the top of the hour, so uh, we are going to cut it off here. We did get a few questions in the last minute or so. Uh, everyone who did submit a question over the last minute or so, please note that uh, either myself uh, or one of our technical sales staff will contact you directly to answer the questions that you do have. Jeff, I want to thank you very much once again uh, for the presentation today. Very informative, lots of ground to cover. Uh, no pun intended. But, uh, I wish I hadn't been making so much extraneous noise, <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And on behalf of ITM University, we want to thank every one of you for participating in our webinar today. Uh, we are available, as mentioned a couple times, uh, in any way. Please visit our website, itm.com. Uh, you can find all our contact information there, the pricing, availability, rental options, buying options, anything that you that you desire. Uh, if you can't find it there, please contact uh, us and one of our technical sales staff. We will definitely be able to help and answer any and all of your questions. Um, at the end of this webinar, we will have a short survey. Uh, we do ask you if, uh, if you can take the, uh, the 30 seconds to a couple minutes to, to, to complete it. Your feedback will help us assist uh, in improving our webinars as well as bring you more subjects that you are of interest. Um, we also have a few upcoming webinars uh, over the course of the next few weeks and months. Please visit the training section of itm.com for a list of dates and subjects. And don't forget that as a thank you for attending today, uh, your name will go into a draw to win $100 towards your next online order. Uh, the, announce, uh, the winner will be announced on our social media channel, so please be sure to check us out there. Once again, thank you, Jeff, very much, and thank you all for joining us today. Wishing you all a great rest of the day.